Our first speaker has been making music most of his life. When he's not producing music at the public lunch studios, he's playing Dungeons and Dragons or enjoying time with his soulmate and their young boys. Sometimes both. Please welcome Pat Pallardy. I built my intro into my, uh, into my speech, so I'm just gonna say, you should just preface everything I say with I think or I feel. It sounds really definite when I, when I do it so quickly. You ready, Donovan? I'm Pat Pilardi, I'm a father and a husband, I'm a record producer and a live mixer, and I'm a dungeon master for several campaigns at D&D. Um, it's awesome, I love it. I spend most of my time trying to engage people creatively or facilitate some kind of creative process, uh, personally and professionally. And this kind of leads me to think a lot about human creativity and what it's built on. And I've been able to identify three intellectual types of it. There's a inside out kind of type, which is artistic, an outside in type, which is usually found in pattern recognition and knowledge based type of skills, and there's craftsmanship, which is technical problem solving. The artistic type is often, or kind of best described as people that are so in touch with what it means to go through the human experience, they're able to communicate it through abstract ways like pottery or novels and song in a way that we can find profoundly moving. This is a real gift and it often is a curse as well. Knowledge and pattern recognition types of creativity I find are best exemplified in modern day science. And it's really a way of like looking at data sets or your senses and being able to extrapolate truths from it and then taking those truths and looking at them as data sets and extrapolating more truths out of them. And we've come so far in this regard and it is a gift as well. Craftsmanship kind of surrounds these intellectual types of creativity and it's a way of making them real or trying to problem solve these, these things along the way. And it, without it, we really wouldn't have a lot to show, I, I feel like, on the, of the other two types of creativity. I'm a craftsman myself. I'm, a, I'm a deeply a craftsman. And I feel like Leonardo da Vinci is one of the people that has, rare people that has firmly embodied all three of these types of creativity. And just because of it, he was hundreds of years ahead of his time. And we're still like seeing some of his things as being very, um, I wouldn't say cutting edge, but they, they shook the world when they came out. We can see evidence of this uh, types of creativity in some sort of balance in architecture, engineering, record producing, photography, all kinds of things. And they often comes out of some type of mentorship. It's often a small class or a one-on-one -on -one learning because to become a craftsman, it really is about time in. You have to have a lot of theoretical knowledge, but you also have to have an excellent grasp of the technical considerations of your craft to be able to problem solve within it. And once you have that, you can start problem solving really creatively. You can start bending the rules and breaking the rules in ways that other people haven't really thought of. And as a craftsman, when I'm doing Dungeons and Dragons, I have to kind of try to engage people creatively in, in the, all of these different ways. And it's very similar when I'm a record producer. Dungeons and Dragons, for those of you who don't know, is a collaborative storytelling game. There's hundreds of ways to play it, but at its heart, you sit down with your friends and you make a story together. It's awesome. It can go anywhere, it can be anything, and uh, if it isn't what you like, then you're doing it wrong. There's two real roles in it. There's a game master who kind of provides the backdrop and the story and the setting for everybody to, to partake in. And there's the players that have to be willing to immerse themselves into this imaginary reality and try to be as invested as they can. The job of the game master is to try to, it, sorry, it's a lot like your favorite book. This is my favorite book. And you imagine yourself and your best friends as the main characters in it. You're sitting down at a table with the author and you're writing the book as you go. Um, it's incredibly liberating. You can explore all types of themes and concepts and it's one of the, my favorite things to do, honestly. The role of the game master is that of a craftsman because you have to be so technically competent with the rules that they never bubble to the surface. Once they bubble to the surface, it's like showing the camera in a movie. You have to be never breaking that fifth wall. You have to be immersive and engaging and you have to build some type of investment in the people that are playing or else it never is anything more than an imaginary world. The first way I like to do this is through the senses. I like to engage people as physical creatures in a physical space. I'd like to tell them about how it smells, how it sounds, what it feels like on their feet, what their clothing feels like, is it wet, is it dry, how tired they are, are they lost, are they hungry? 
These types of things can become adversaries. These types of things can become allies. You have to interact with the environment and each other as players in order to deal with the environment. And this is the first step in kind of becoming engaging is, is through the senses. And when you're engaging with it, with each other, you're starting to do the second thing, which is starting to engage emotionally. If you want to try to engage your players emotionally in your game, you have to do that through people and through relationships. Those are really what drive us as people. If you think about this first scene in Empire where Luke meets Yoda, it's full of character. It says so much about them as individual people, and it says so much about their relationship going forward as a method of them developing as characters. The same thing can be said for Darth Vader. At his worst, he's a black-clad evil space wizard, which sucks, but he's brought to life through the nuances of his relationship with his son and his master, which are full of shades of, of gray, and he becomes the focal point of a conflict of ideas. And this is the third thing you have to do to kind of immerse and engage your players. You have to fill your world with ideas that are in conflict with each other and force them to make value judgments around them. If you can force them to make these value judgments, then they want to take part. Think about things that are happening in the world today. There's so many types of ideas and conflict, and everybody has a strong opinion about them, whether that's environmentalism versus the economy, the state of liberal democracy, or the role of the arts in general. All of these things people have strong opinions on, and it, it, it incites people with a call to action. And when you can do that, you're in, instilling people with investment and involvement in a story. So these are the classical five parts of what makes up a good story. And I've kind of touched on everything so far but plot. But that, this is the secret, I think, to engaging them creatively in the other ways. If you can develop the world, the backdrops, the ideas and conflicts, the players will naturally find a plot that aligns with what they want to explore in your game world. And the plot will become something that all of you want to explore together. Um, and when you're doing that, everybody's having fun and everybody's winning. And that's really what, uh, what you know, being creative in a lot of ways is about. And there you go. Thank you.